Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, from Software's 2019 action-adventure game, is a masterpiece. It takes place in Japan, in an era known as the Sengoku period. This notorious time in Japanese history is defined by the constant state of brutal civil war and conflict between many independent states that lasted nearly 150 years. Specifically, the story occurs within the fictionalized region of Ashina during the end of this period. There did exist an actual Ashina clan who, similar to their in-game counterparts, were defeated in a climactic battle in 1589 in the Battle of Suryagehara. Decades before the start of the game, the character Ishin Ashina led an uprising to retake his homeland from the numerous clans that had overrun and claimed it. Following a brief period of relative stability, Ashina is once again under siege this time by the Interior Ministry, who seeks to unify all of Japan under one banner. Ishin's grandson and successor, Genichiro, realizes that Ashina will soon be a lost cause, and kidnaps the Divine Heir, the young Lord Kuro, who has been born with the strange gift of immortality. His retainer, a shinobi named Wolf, whose life has been defined by servitude and violence, is our player character, and in his rescue attempt, becomes entangled in the fate of Ashina itself. From Kingsfield, to the Souls titles, to Bloodborne, all the way to Elden Ring, the settings of many of From Software's dark titles have been worlds of ruin, post-apocalyptic dark fantasy. The worlds, or at least the lands the game take place in, have already been shattered by someone or something. The primary conflict has already happened, and the remaining major players are either long gone or have become husks of their former selves. Cataclysmic events may occur in the endgame of these titles, but the result is usually characters fighting over the scraps of what's left of their respective societies. Sekiro stands out from these titles in a number of ways. First, we are specifically in Japan and not a fictionalized amalgam of various European locales. Secondly, although large conflicts have led to the stage this story takes place in, the world is still alive and has a future. Third, we are active participants of the fate of Ashina, rather than just essentially dark fantasy archaeologists. And finally, our character has a defined background and role in this story and its conclusion. The elements of his legacy reflect his antagonists, and this all comes together to form a story far more personal and directly engaging than any of these other aforementioned titles. Wolf has real stakes in the game here, with the rescue of his lord directly at odds with the goals of our primary antagonists. And of those antagonists, Genichiro Ashina in particular is a very compelling one. Beyond the surface level appeal of two similarly skilled warriors clashing in intense combat, their motivations mirror each other in interesting ways. Genichiro has an understandable motivation to save his grandfather and his homeland, even if his methods are quite despicable. The second encounter with him is a real highlight of the game, tying together Wolf as a character's objectives and the player's desire for revenge after their first encounter. Note the change in camera angles when the player successfully brings these kinds of battles to a close, highlighting the intensity between these two characters. This culminates in a very cinematic part of the game that is extremely cathartic when successfully conquered. Ishin Ashina himself personifies the Sengoku period as a fierce warrior and lord. If one pursues the Shura ending, which ends the game prematurely with a unique string of bosses, we challenge him in a scenario similar to the other past their prime fallen elder characters of Souls and Bloodborne. However, in most ending routes of the game, we have the unique opportunity to challenge him in his prime in the final battle. There's a poetic quality to that climactic challenge on a number of levels. Wolf resoundly beats Genichiro for the final time after losing to him in the same place at the beginning of the story. In his second phase, Ishin begins wielding a spear. This is the same spear we see in the introductory cutscene, wielded by General Temura, who is defeated by Ishin, who claimed it as a trophy. This same spear was later awarded to Gyobu Oniwa, who uses it against us in the battle with him. This final battle, and Ishin's embodiment of war, represents the closure of the Sengoku period in Japan as Ashina burns in the distance. Several of From Software's games prior to this one had meditations in one form or another on immortality being a crime against nature, but that concept gets explored in more depth here via direct story developments and dialogue. 
Wolf's goal in the latter half of the game is to acquire the Mortal Blade and the other items necessary to sever Lord Kuro's immortality. Along our quest to restore the natural order of life and death, we've witnessed those who have resorted to dishonorable methods to attain it for themselves, with predictably grotesque and extreme costs. There is an increased emphasis on balance and harmony, perfect for this setting. The concept of a top-notch Japanese warrior protecting his son, figuratively in this case, can most likely be traced back to the series Lone Wolf and Cub, which is a highly regarded graphic novel series that was later adapted into several movies and television programs. This game utilizes a blend of historical elements and mythology in the same way that the Souls titles do, but of course this time with a Japanese twist. Shintoism and Buddhism are both given representation in Sekiro, both in overt and subtle ways. An element of Shinto is the observation of the gods that can be found in nature, of which over 8 million are observed. An easily recognized symbol of Shintoism are these gates, called Tori. These mark the transition from our regular world into a sacred place. Another element of Shintoism is the sanctity of running water, which is a major story element within the world of Sekiro. Clean streams and rivers were and are utilized by members of Shinto as places of purification. Similarly, within Buddhism, water symbolizes the flow of being. Buddhism is the way towards enlightenment and the pursuit of deliverance to withdraw from the cycle of reincarnation and to reach heaven. That cycle of reincarnation occurs in a very literal form throughout the game, as Wolf dies and is resurrected numerous times to achieve his goals. These themes and many more are explored within Sekiro. Fountainhead Palace is a holy place of divinity, where waters of rejuvenation flows forth downwards from the shrine and resting place of the Divine Dragon, a symbol of immortality, into the mortal realms of Ashina and beyond. The stagnation of these waters has led to both the spiritual and material corruption of many of Ashina's inhabitants. The nobles encountered here represent the unnatural stagnation of life in their form of immortality. Interestingly, if the nobles are able to grab you, then they'll drain your health and even sap your ability to reincarnate, again tying the lore and game mechanics in that classically effective From Software way. In Japanese folklore, centipedes are usually symbols of impurity. While they occasionally have a positive connotation for being associated with the god of warfare, and therefore were sometimes seen on banners of samurai and warlords, by and large they were regarded negatively. Their most famous mythological depiction are the omukade. Omukade are massive centipedes with dark bodies and orange legs and heads. They are based on the real-life mukade, large venomous centipedes that can grow to be up to 20 centimeters long. Traditionally, in the folklore, omukade are so tough that they can't be hurt by standard weapons, although they do have an unusual weakness to human saliva. In Sekiro, they are symbols of the stagnation of the waters and decay, and they can only be killed by the usage of the mortal blade. One piece of famous Japanese folklore is the story of Hidesado, who climbed Mount Mikami to defeat a giant omukade that was tormenting the people there. Upon his success, the princess of the mountain, the daughter of the Dragon King, rewarded Hidesado with a bag of rice that never emptied, along with several other similar treasures. In Sekiro, we climb Mount Kongo, which is similarly plagued by centipedes, and gain the tool in which to slay them from the Divine Child, who also then provides us with an unending supply of rice. There are many other elements of Shintoism, Buddhism, mythology, and Japanese folklore utilized within the game, and I encourage anyone interested in this stuff to look into it further. Many elements in the game have a very cool mythological inspiration behind them. Sekiro's gameplay diversifies itself enough from the other recent big titles from From Software that I don't think it really qualifies as a Souls-like. There are no stats to invest in, there's no weapon diversity. Instead, the core gameplay revolves around the concept of clashing swords, thrilling duels that function like a deadly game of tug-of-war as you attempt to break your enemy's posture and deliver a deadly blow. There is still an element of customization that accentuates this core concept in the form of the multiple skill trees and prosthetics that allow you to tune Sekiro's gameplay to your liking with a surprising amount of synergy between them. As a shinobi, Several of these prosthetics and abilities tie into the concept of stealth and silent assassinations, while others are more directly combat-focused. Movement outside of combat feels extremely fluid, from simply running and jumping around to utilizing the grappling hook. Stealth has been implemented in a functional, if fairly conservative fashion, despite the game's lineage as a Tenchu successor, 
and our role in the game as a shinobi. You can sneak around a bit, distract and lure enemies, and some of your skills and equipment play into this. It's not as fleshed out as a dedicated stealth title, but I felt as though it was decently implemented, all things considered. I struggled a lot with Sekiro's combat on the game's release because, presumably like many other people, I was attempting to play it like a Souls game. I kept trying to dodge attacks, and I was extremely reluctant to block attacks with the katana, considering how ineffective doing so would usually be in those other titles. As a result, the first several hours of the game were made exponentially more difficult for me. But after many, many, many deaths, I made it to the Genichiro fight, and again, like presumably many other people, this is where the game's combat clicked, and I had the Neo moment. You can block nearly every attack in the game. The only ones that can't be are 100% telegraphed by a loud sound effect and a big flashing kanji on the screen. And even then, some of those attacks can still secretly be blocked or deflected if they're timed correctly. This moment of realization immediately elevated Sekiro into the stratosphere of gaming enjoyment and intensity for me. Timing your blocks to produce a deflection is addictive thanks not only to the success in gameplay, but also to the wonderful visual and audio feedback amplification when it happens. Sparks fly and the metallic clang of the clashing of the weapons is much louder when you successfully deflect, giving you multiple signals that it was performed successfully. A successful deflection means that not only did you block the attack, but you inflicted posture damage on your opponent while doing so. Additionally, no matter how high your current posture damage is, your guard can never be broken if you continue to time your deflects correctly. Both you and your enemies accrue more posture damage as health decreases, and it also recovers more slowly as well. But this can lead to these wonderful moments of your back against the wall, nearly dead, out of resources, and fighting back like a cornered animal. In addition to the fights themselves being extremely engaging on a mechanical level, they are elevated even further due to the aforementioned greater involvement of our protagonist in the immediate story. There is an emotional component here as a result that is not often found in From Software's games. Sakura's opponents include rivals, mentors, and people who generally have major and real-time stakes in the plot. It's thrilling stuff, and some of the boss fights in the game are some of the best that I've ever experienced in any title. Sometime after release, From Software added a boss rematch feature that allows you to re-challenge them both individually or in continuous gauntlets for the ultimate challenges that the game can provide. It's an oft-requested feature of their games, and it makes sense here given the concept of reliving the memories of our protagonist and the cycles of struggle that were already elements found within the base game. In another change of pace from From Software's recent titles, Sekiro utilizes a broader and much more colorful palette for its depiction of medieval Japan and beyond. The grime and blood is balanced wonderfully with cherry blossoms and freshly fallen leaves. The snow-covered grounds of Ashina Castle provides a pleasing visual contrast to the bold, ornate infrastructure and elegantly armored samurai who guard its gates. Harada Estate, with its rain-soaked bamboo, provide a familiar soul's atmosphere with a Japanese twist, before moving into the flaming central compound, displaying some truly exceptional fire and smoke effects. Visiting Mount Congo during the daytime portion of the game also struck me with its rich flora and overall greenery. As Sekiro leans progressively into mythological territory towards the endgame, the settings and vistas in tune grow with captivating splendor, culminating in the Fountainhead Palace and the encounter with the Divine Dragon. All in all, it's a beautiful use of color that would continue to be utilized in a similar manner in the studio's next title, Elden Ring. Sekiro was the first of the recent FromSoft games to utilize ambient music for its locales, and it manages to do so effectively. I don't think these tracks are especially mind-blowing, but they are certainly fitting. The soundtrack was composed by Yuka Kitamura, at this point a FromSoft veteran, having produced some extremely memorable tracks for Bloodborne and Dark Souls 2 and 3. However, the music for the boss fights and cutscenes is where this score truly shines. Themes like Genichiro, Strength and Discipline, Divine Dragon, find Kitamura firing on all cylinders, maintaining a creative peak from the already top-notch work done on games prior. The Divine Dragon fight in particular, combining those elements of gameplay, mythological folklore, story, and music to produce something that is borderline transcendental. It is without a shadow of a doubt the best gimmick fight out of any of the recent From Software games, and to use the word gimmick to describe it feels inappropriate considering how grand and hair-raising it is. Yes, it's that good. Kitamura's sound palette for the soundtrack 
ranges from deadly intensity to grandiose wonder to emotional minimalism, and it is all executed with noticeable passion. There is an interesting interview with her that was conducted by Game Informer, where she spoke about her process of creating music for the game, and how the major change in setting contrasted with the previous titles. It's wild to see her working in this typically sterile game development environment, and be producing tracks of this caliber. This woman is writing music for award-winning, multi-million selling games, and her second monitor is stacked on top of a cardboard box. Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is a masterpiece and is absolutely one of the best games I've ever played. It was announced to have reached 5 million sales back in September of 2020, so it was undoubtedly a financial success. I don't think Sekiro really needs a sequel, but one of the endings and plot lines in the game could easily lead to one. The Divine Dragon and Immortality Heritage is referenced several times as having been originated in the West, and Sad Ending has our main characters deciding to journey there to end the immortal wellspring from the source. This could very easily be, and possibly is intended to be a reference to Journey to the West, a classic piece of Chinese mythology that has served as the inspiration for many, many stories and pieces of media. Even if we don't follow this game's characters, that setting would make a wonderful follow-up. But more than anything else, I would love to see the core gameplay of Sekiro developed further. That central element of swords clashing and that tug-of-war posture system is so well done that I think it would be a shame not to develop it further. The first thing that comes to mind would be to potentially expand the primary weapon arsenal while maintaining the pace and intensity of the combat. I don't mean a massive collection of similar weapons like the Souls titles, but a small and distinct and utility set of weapons similar to other action games like Devil May Cry or Ninja Gaiden. One of the lead designers of Sekiro, Masaru Yamamura, has been named as the director of the upcoming Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon. I am very much looking forward to that game, both as a modern iteration of that series and its own lineage of great qualities, but also to see what this talented designer can accomplish in the director's seat. It was only recently that I replayed Sekiro. I've dipped into it a few times since its release, but I hadn't actually completed a full playthrough of it since the first time I played it. But in doing so recently, I walked away with an even greater appreciation for this title. I think Sekiro is one of the strongest games of From Software's last decade of output, and considering the general quality level of said output, that's saying a lot. Give it a shot if you haven't already, or another if you have. It's really worth another look, and hopefully I've communicated why. That's all for this time. Thank you very much for watching.